What's up, y'all? We're back with part two of George M. Johnson's All Boys Aren't Blue. So um, we just finished um, the first act. So Johnson titled the first act A Different Kid. So um, this second, the second act is titled Family, and it depends how we go, if it's just going to be act two and act three with um, this part. And um, yeah, let's get to it. So um, act two... Um, like I said, it's titled Family, so this is like a dedica uh, um, a series of essays that are dedicated to um, family members. So um, the first family member is this um, short letter um, for um, their little brother for their little brother um, Garrett, and pretty much so it's a pretty much a tribute to um, Garrett, and um, pretty much talking about being a queer person and having um, a heterosexual um, brother. And those dynamics and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, Garrett also always um, know lets George know that they're there for them and, and supports them when wherever they go, and um, and affirms and supports their queer, their queerness and stuff like that. Like they never um, alienated George and stuff like that. Like um, Garrett was able to um, spike spike on um, George's interest in them um, sports and stuff like that, but they all they always had this bond and stuff like that. And and um, Garrett didn't and George's sexual and Garrett didn't let George's sexuality um, um, cause any strain or make any difference in their relationship. So they appreciated um, him. They appreciated him for that. And how important it is to um have someone that supports um queerness and um stuff like that, and um and and um George also says like Garrett probably dealt with um some arguments with people over their brother's sexuality and saying you support your brother being gay and stuff like that. So thinking all those things that um. Queer people, not only pe queer people go through, but family members or anyone that's close to um, a queer person, if they're friends and stuff like that, like they're they're willing to fight for them even when they're not around them. So, and I think that's the most important part of movement work. Like you have to um, teach people and advocate on uh, on behalf of communities, even when you're in not in, when you're not in spaces that center that community like you have to center them not just in the space that they occupy but spaces where they tend to be alienated where they tend to be um suppressed and um not represented and um and the george appreciated garrett for that and um that was it it was very short so um the next chapter is titled nanny the caregiver the hustler my best friend so um so um um Johnson learned was pretty much raised by their nanny and pretty much talked this pretty much a chapter dedicated to them and um talked about how more, how important nanny was to their life they they learned how to um cook because of nanny learned how to um clean and organize because of nanny and nanny um um, talked about not even because of vacations, like they they know the importance of luxuries and stuff like that, but also the importance of education. So that's the, why Nanny put them through school, even though she didn't have a college degree or um, I don't even know of a high school education at that. Like able to push um, their kids to make sure they're they're more aware and more informed about the world. And um, she talked about how he, um, he. They talked about how even though she was like the baby of thirteen kids, she was always in charge, and even with even when her um, siblings were alive, like she's always great at delegating. And Johnson was able to um learn take cues and stuff like that. And um, and um, what was the next one? Also told them the importance of. How hustling can be um, is also important. Is all it's important to sustain yourself and stuff like that. So um, nanny had all these services and all these um, businesses. Like I, they were they were running a daycare and also had a catering um, service and um, what else they were doing. They were a registered nurse, so the, she was a, she was doing all of this. And um, 
and I was thinking racism and classism and misogyny probably got to her point that she had is like no choice that she had to, but it was fortunate that she was able to do all of this and, um, and have a support system and was able to contribute to that support system and being there for George and her other grandkids. Because she also, she always says, I love all my grandkids, but I love each of you differently because you each need different things. So pretty much talked about, even though you're doing all of this, like you never forgot um, that your children, your grandchildren and anyone in your house are human beings and they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. So that was um that was beautiful. And um gr N Nanny also also taught um um Johnson um how to sell. So selling candy in um schools like I know in high school and people people be selling candies and candy and stuff like that, pastries and stuff like that. And um also taught on um, Johnson business. So what you should charge and um what profit you can make out of and stuff like that. So that was a that was it was nice that someone like that can keep on um, Johnson disciplined and uh, motivated to do things. So it was it was a pretty cute um part of the um, chapter. And um and um, Johnson also talked about how when they were in Catholic school, they needed to complete 250 hours of community service, which I find ridiculous because in PG County, you need like, it used to be like 36 hours and it turned to like 24 hours, but 250 hours, <laughs> like that, they're serious about that. But um, Nanny was able to um, make a soup kitchen in um, the church and um, able to get Johnson to volunteer to um, help make soup for the soup and other food for the sick and shut in in the church. So she's a hustler. She's able to do what it takes to um, make sure her children and grand grandchildren were able to get a, get any resource and opportunity um, to succeed. And, um, and, um, and, jo and Johnson was talking about how they were having trouble making friends and stuff like that. But Nanny was able to, Nanny said, I'll be your best friend. And Nanny was playing video games with him, Johnson. Like, it, it tells you, like, you're human too, even if you're a grandparent or a parent. And you can be your child's best friend or something like that. Like... Like, I know grandparents were like, I'm not your little friend. I'm not what your little friends. But Johnson gave, like, a redefinition of friendship here. Like, friends hold you accountable. Friends want the best for you. Friends want you to grow. And you learn from your friends and stuff like that. Because Nanny was also learning things from Johnson. And, um... And, um... Nanny was... And Johnson was also talking about... Um, how queer affirming, but that their that their family was, but still trying to learn about people because um, they have a cousin that um, identified as trans named Hope, and, um, and and there was a lot of queer representation in that family. So they have an aunt that's a let they have an aunt that's a lesbian. So that kind of let let their nanny know nanny to be open minded and learn about people and um and jo and Johnson said how important it was to um to have those representations even though you don't see those representations in media and um yeah also talking about how some families you're lucky to be a queer child in that family. And but some families they'll literally contribute to the violence of LGBTQ plus communities. Like there's a large number of homelessness of queer youth. And um, Johnson talked about um, the murder of Giovanni Melton. For those who don't know, um, Giovanni Melton was murdered by his father because his father said, "I'd rather have a dead child than a gay child." Like stuff like that is literally happening as a recent and. Um, I forgot when that happened. It was November 2nd, 2017. Giovanni Melton got murdered by their father. And um, and um, it's like, it's, it tells you how hatred can literally go through you to the, to the point where you, you murder your own fam, your own children. Like, 
it's it's really tells you like how we need to um tackle um anti queerness and how we need to um unlearn and um not take and not take anything um that society um feeds us and um Johnson also talked about how in um, some queer communities, they have this thing called a created family. And it is a system in which friends from many walks of life create extremely tight friendship circles in an effort to ensure a familial type of environment for the many who are not accepted at home. So for example, if y'all don't know the television show Pose, which is really good, it talks about um, the ballroom culture in New York from the late 80s and the 90s. And it's, um, it's, they have these things called houses and these houses com- consist of, um, trans people and, um, queer people. And a lot of, th- a lot of them were homeless. A lot of them were kicked out of their house of, the, of, um, of the, their birth family. So they got to a chosen family. So same thing with, um, birth names and chosen names and stuff like that. And, um, and, um, also said, um, our culture has always found a way to create safety and refuge where there was none. So pretty much talked about, um, like, just because you're blood doesn't mean that you're family and stuff like that. And um, Johnson gave this advice to people that are struggling with their sexuality and maybe in an environment where they're not accepted and said, you should build the support system that you want to have around you. So you have to surround yourself with um, people that affirms you and accepts you, whether that's family members that family members that are may not be in the house, whether that's friends, whether that's um, teachers, whether that's mentors, um, people that are in your community, whether it's neighbors, whether it's organizations like there's literally organizations that cater to um, LGBTQ youth homeless that are homeless and um and um yeah like like johnson said they don't like the phrase make get it that it gets better but they rather um rephrase it and said you have to make it better and know that there is a community out there that will love you and that goes into um bell hooks all about love um message so um yeah so um talking about the importance of nanny and stuff like that like even nanny even though nanny isn't famous um she deserves to get her flowers like she's not going to win any awards from glad and she won't have her picture hung up during black history month or make any headlines for operating out of a place of love but um she knows that there's a community that will give her her flowers and uh, that's her family which is even more special and um and um, Nanny, she always lived in a place of unconditional love. And you should pass off that unconditional love, not just within your family, but to um, people that you have other relationships with, whether that's friends and stuff like that. So it's com- it's communal. So it's this thing, the unconditional love that Bell Hooks um, talked about on All About Love. And um, chapter eight is a tribute um, to Johnson's father. So it's titled Daddy Second Chance. So um, it started off with um, the background of um, Johnson's father. Um, their their father was born in the family home in um, Williamsburg, Virginia. And there was a lot of history in that home. And um, talking about um, the relatives that are in their, father's side, their father's side of the family. And... Um, and um, talking about the experiences being in that family home... Like it, they said that it that um their great great grandfather or either great grandfather um built that house with them um, their own hands, and um even built like some shot houses um behind it, so um there was a lot of history attached to that house, and um one time when um Johnson was visiting that house um there were they they heard all these noises when when they were with their cousin they heard they heard all these noises and think thought they were ghosts and their grandma their maternal grand their paternal grandmother so their father's mother said y'all that's your ancestors that's not 
you you let all these white people be afraid of ghosts because of clan outfits those are your ancestors so that made them not afraid of whatever's going on in their house so they and um i think some relatives were were buried near that house so there was a lot of history in that house but then it eventually and then eventually gentrification happened so that became that house that field and all of that it became like a a mall parking lot pavements and stuff like that. So um tells you the importance of goes back into telling your histories and how it's important to have or oratorial history too, because you experience things and you saw the change and it's up to you to know to um archive that and pass it on to um other generations so they can learn about what's going on. And um, how you can prevent those other things from happening in your time. So, um, yeah, so that was that. And um, and um, Johnson's father was like their first exposure to how patriarchy, patriarchal practices are um, were going on because their father and their uncles, they're always the ones that weren't um, cooking. They weren't helping cleaning up. They were, and they didn't even throw, they didn't have the courtesy to even throw the, throw away their food. It was always the women that were taking care of the functions. So um, pretty much um, talked about how, um, how, um, yeah, how these gender dynamics are going on and how masculinity and femininity and how these gender roles play out. And that also that's also why um it's titled All Boys Aren't Blue, because Johnson um talked about how boy is the masculine um color and how that represents boy and gender reveals. And um and um but Johnson was um also always helping up nan always helping nanny and um the, um the always the functions and stuff like that always helped um be an assistant and um told their father um you need to throw away your food and stuff like that and um that caught their father off guard and was like what and um pretty much um uh, yeah like even to the point where it's someone that birthed you like they're they can be they can be internalizing on problematic um things and um and um yeah you said i i know y'all not about to have grandma clean up after y'all like it's it's it tells you like everything is social is socialized and stuff like that and um then um talked about um their half um sib their half siblings because they have half siblings from their father's um previous marriage and um their half brother um Gigi is is um a gay is also gay and um pretty much talked about how before um Gigi identified as gay and um they're they yeah they always had this relationship that's that was um very tough they always had this rocky relationship and um and um their father and they and they extended grace to their father like their father probably didn't have the knowledge of there's like no guidebook to how to raise a queer child like there's no media representations of um how to raise queer um people so it was hard for um their father to have like a good relationship with um Gigi. so um yeah they butted heads a lot and um and then they said when my father married my mother Gigi didn't take it well so typical stepmom drama and um like all these things are happening so um Gigi they didn't like they didn't and like George didn't have a good didn't have like a stable didn't have a connected relationship with Gigi until they got older and so then they got to understand each other and that helped um George with um understanding their queer identity and um yeah so george saw um since Gigi is older george saw himself as like his father their father's um second chance to um actually get it right and um actually have a good relationship even if you don't really understand it it's important to have affirmation and dignity and respect and they were playing foot and 
And um, Johnson and their father played football together. So um, they were able to, and that that helped um, establish like a foundation to their relationship. Because um, eventually um, their, uh, their father was providing so much financial support um, to George and financial support through sports um, when they were in private and Catholic school. When, through um, college tuition when they were in Virginia Union University and even rents when they were um, living off campus. So it tells you like it's important to have a foundation with um, even if you don't even even if you, uh, you and the other person don't see eye to eye like it's important to um, get to a place where of understanding and um, know that you can heal from any trauma and um yeah, and um, I'm yeah. So this was this was literally counter act. Is this was literally counter to um, Darnell L. Moore's um, "No Ashes in a Fire" because their father was abusive and stuff like that. Like we're learning about a father that's not getting it right all the time, but willing to take the chance to um, actually invest in um, the growth and development of a black queer um, child. And I say, for example, um, when Dwayne Wade um, trying to um, Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union, everyone should take notes about them and um, their parenting and um, how they were able to um, try to understand and raise um, a trans daughter. So um, through, yeah, Zaya Wade. So it was literally what's going on here and how it's important to have affirmation even when you don't understand it. You can always learn. And um, yeah, let me see if there was other things. Yeah, so after that part of the chapter, um, their father was going through a near-death experience later in life. Like, um, yeah, he had um, congestive heart failure. And um, it, it was one of those um, near-death experiences that made you appreciate everyone around you even more. And um, that goes into Bell Hooks All About Love and how her cancer scare and stuff like that, it um, helped her trying to um appreciate the people around you and you shouldn't have it shouldn't have to take that ch chance and even adrian marie brown talked about that in pleasure activism and um yeah he was in a full face oxygen mask um and he cried and and um johnson talked about how rare um, he saw his father um cried their father cried and um yeah and pretty much tapped into um how masculinity um ha get, makes uh, men and boys get these certain um fronts and um and then um it's in, it's just important to be in touch with um your own emotions and stuff like that so um yeah yeah and um there was this um it was this um paragraph that stuck out to me it was this this short paragraph in the last paragraph. I watch a black man criticize black queer boys every day, and that's not how to not to say my community is more homophobic than others, or that I don't see where black straight men affirm me. But by and large, it's not enough. My father taught me that as much as I feel that straight black men are often my oppressors, there are moments that I also know they can be my protectors. That the social conditioning that told us to hate our own because of sex and gender can be broken. Much like my father, my community has a second chance. No one that gives their black queer children a chance to survive an anti-black world already against them. I get bigotry anywhere else. My father made sure I at least didn't get it at home by using the tools he had the best he knew how. And yeah, that's literally, that's literally went into how Ashada Shakur was going about it in a, um, an autobiography. Like, how can you bring black children in a world that already is going to hate them? So it's, and it's the same way in um, raising um, a black queer child and stuff, black queer person and stuff like that. Like, um, think about anti-blackness, but think about anti-blackness and anti-queerness and, um, how those forces can um, shape the experience of a person's life. And you can't, and, um, and I think that also contributed to how um, their family was working because they didn't understand, they didn't understand and they, they, they tried to um, so function off more off of a safety and they, and protection. Like, I think some people, they suppressed a, a person's queer identity out of safety because they know the world is already going to hate them. 
And that's problematic and that's still problematic, but that's how that person understands things. But you have to also learn that they deserve to be free and deserve to be happy because if you're going to suppress that queer identity, that person is not going to be in our authentic self and they're not going to understand themselves. And um, and that's and that can lead to emotional violence and that can lead to like something like depression and suicide and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so that's that's it was it was a pretty good chapter. And shows that um, even if you don't, if you even if you're not part of a community, you can do things to understand that community and provide some support. So, um, chapter nine is titled "Losing Hope." So this was a tribute to um, the trans, um, the trans cousin that I mentioned before in um, Nanny's chapter. There, um, it was um, in tribute to um, their um, cousin Hope who um, eventually passed away from HIV and AIDS. And um, it was, and it was there, it was um, Johnson's, one of Johnson's early exposures to uh, queerness because, and um, no, and attack, and trying to understand um, gender and stuff like that because um, Hope is a trans woman. So Johnson also talked about um, earlier um, how they were, because they under because they know that they were attracted to boys and they think the only way they're able to do that is if they were a girl so they were um going through this d- gender dysphoria and um and they didn't know that it was possible for boys to be attracted to boys and yeah they were they were going through a lot and stuff like that and um hope was like a representation of of that and even though they know Hope had this journey, um, it, it is possible to be a man attracted to a man. And um, but it was like they're one of their first um, experiences um, learning about um, being unapologetic and being happy in um, the queer community. And um, yeah, so they 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 talked about how they had a connection uh, ever since and hope knew that they that um and hope knew that george was probably queer and um because they have both have this um different um um personality that johnson was talking about and johnson was talking about how hope was like a reflection and um trying to understand um queer culture and queer identity and um hope's birth name is um germaine and um and johnson said um there is truly something to be said about the fact that you sometimes you like this is like a letter to hope there's truly something to be said about the fact that you sometimes can't see yourself if you can't see other people like you existing, thriving, working. I can only imagine the courage it took for you to be yourself. Like thinking about, this is probably like 2000, it was probably like 2003 when um, Hope transitioned into a woman. And even today, like transphobia and stuff like that is still going on. So thinking about 2003, that's, that's something like, and you were able to still be proud in your identity. And um, like it's even hard for trans people to just simply exist. And um, yeah, and then um, Johnson went into when the family announced that Jermaine now wants to go by Hope. And even though um, Jer- Johnson gave praise to Nanny in the other chapter, Nanny was still learning. Like they were hesitant and stuff like that. And said, I'm going to call it. I don't know, but um, I'm gonna go by. I'm gonna call. Um, I'm gonna call him Jermaine still, cause that's how I knew. But then she eventually got to this place where, okay, I might still call you Jermaine, but it's still gonna give me some time to um give to um n- understand you and um learn you. So, um, it's nice to meet you. Hope. And that's literally the process that everyone has to go through, even if you internalize something that's transphobic. And um, yeah, Hope and and Johnson they had a really good relationship. Like they and like Hope um, wanted um, 
had um George um take her to places and they were having like some fun times. But then it eventually um got to um Hope getting sick and stuff like that. So um that's the HIV and AIDS. But even before they died, they were still making jokes and stuff like that. They always find this joy even when they're about to um even when they're suffering. And I think that you can learn a lot from that. And um it's important to um, give flowers to um, trans people and know that they deserve love, even in a world, and especially in a world that hates them. And um, capitalism and colonialism and everything we understand about gender um, contributes to the violence that they go through. And um, we have to do everything, do whatever it takes to combat that. And. Um, Ooh, what was what was going on? What, what was next <laughs> and um yeah that was it for um that chapter so it was pretty much talking about trans visibility and um know that trans people existed because they had they had a lot of queer family members in that family and i think that helped them to be more accepting and understanding and um respectful and um yeah, so Hope helped um, contribute to the growth and development of that family. And Johnson also said, however, there is beauty in knowing that whichever way I go, I was here and I left here being myself. So that was the message that um, Johnson got from Hope. And that was it for that chapter. And then um, there was um, um, a dear mommy. So this was a tribute to um Johnson's mother. So it was a beautiful um tribute to um their mom. So um their mom, even though she wasn't always in the always in the house and nanny was the primary caregiver, their mom was able to um give them any um support, um and also gave them like a like a circle of friends, whether that's um their aunt, and knew that and. And their mom knew that George was um, having a tough time trying to understand themselves and knew that they were different. So their mom probably knew that they were queer. And um, like, you, like you gave me a good relationship with my aunt Aubrey, who, Audrey, who just happened to be a lesbian. And, um, and um, other um, friends and stuff like that, like like um, even though she didn't understand what he was going through, she tried to um, put him and put them in community with other people that probably understand the experiences that they were going through, and try to love and support them the best way they know how. And I think that's like the most beautiful way to go about it. And um, that was it. And it's important. To, and um, even when you, and we even when she was having these brain surgeries, she was providing safety and reassurance. She was always knowing, always asking, "How are you doing?" and and um, what's wrong and stuff like that. And know that I'm always here for you. So that was a beautiful um, dedication um, to uh, their mom. So the next chapter was titled "A Lesson Before Dying." And this was um, pretty much um, a, another dedication unto their nanny because they eventually, because she eventually um, died because of uh, a brain cancer. And this was a tribute to her. And she she survived breast cancer um, twice, and um, and and I think even lung cancer. Like nanny was a fighter, and um, she always tried to take care of herself and others. And Johnson was talking about um, this experience um, taking care for Nanny because she was getting old. And she tried, and Johnson was talking about the importance of um, black youth learning to try to take care of their elders and their other family members and stuff like that. Cause they, even cause they're, they're eventually gonna, eventually gonna be vulnerable and not being able to take care of themselves. So that's, it's literally a cycle that, um, that go, happens with um, growth and development and in and, and, um, the sake of humanity. And um, it, and then it was this um, funny moment between them where Nanny, where nanny was um, trying to, would need help dressing herself. And um, 
there and and um also going to the bathroom and stuff like that and was saying help 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 and stuff like that and um and um one of their cousins um said um nanny put some clothes on i don't want to see you in your drawers and nanny responded you better get used to it you might have to wipe my but one day <laughs> she said the a word but she said you might have to wipe my butt one day and she and they eventually did have to um do that and um it pretty much tells you the realities of um taking care of another person when they can't probably and they probably don't have the energy and the power and the capability to do it themselves and they don't have the access to do it so that w and johnson was talking about how those nine words were like a sermon but um yeah, so Nanny and it was talking about how they had to take care of Nanny in the big house. And it was that same big house that Nanny was taking care of them when they were little. And um, and then um, it was also a nice um, section in the in the chapter where, um, yeah, she died recently in 2018. So this was while Johnson was writing the book. And so Johnson didn't know like, how everything was going to turn out when nanny was um in the hospital like um like their nanny um got to um see like the first draft or something of this book or something like got this and but um while in the hospital um nanny understood that she was going to eventually die but um she even um talked to um george about how she wanted her funeral to be in and george said you you're always this is is always how you rock nanny you're always in charge and stuff like that because she got to be in charge of who gives them the eulogy who gets to do the prayer her favorite scriptures and stuff like that so i think that's the beauty of um something like that like especially a homegoing service like someone is sent like we center someone and we give them their flowers and praise and stuff like that and what can we learn from their death and not even just from their death, but through how they lived through life and how they carried themselves when they de when they died, and um, yeah, so she, yeah, so that was a beautiful um, um, it was a beautiful chapter. Johnson said said that they learned from their nanny. I'm controlling the things in my power. I'm putting energy into the things I can change and praying about the rest. And as you said, living my life with no regrets. We still have time here together and we will have the memories forever. Thank you. So yeah, so that was the end of um, that act. Let me see. Because um, it's act three that's next. And... I think this is this was a very short one, so um, I probably can I could probably have time to do this one, and then um, so I'm gonna probably do act so I'm gonna do act three, and then act four will be in the next video. So act three is titled teenagers. So this is pretty much talking about um, experiences as being a teenager and a young adult, and. Um, all these things that teens go through, whether that's sex, drugs, and stuff like that. And so, next chapter was titled, Boys Will Be Boys. So, trigger warning, um, molestation, and um, incest. So, um, chapter, ten, chapter 11 is um, Boys Will Be Boys. And um, Johnson was talking about um, their cousin and Thomas. I don't know if there's their name in real life, so I think it was like... Um, you know, a pseudonym. And, um, and, um, Thomas was, um, um, uh, spending the, spending the night over with, um, George and, um, and, um, Garrett. And, um, Thomas was, uh, was, um, it was, um, yeah, George was 13 and Thomas was a little older. So probably like, mm, 17 or something like that 18 but but um thomas um molested and um molested george and um george was 13 so they were still they didn't like understand that they were taken advantage of so they were learning about sex and stuff like that so tom it was like three in the morning or something like that so everyone was asleep 
and um, they were in a bunk bed. So um, Garrett was on the top bunk and George and Thomas were on the bottom. And um, Thomas told George that they erected that. So um, they were trying to get George to um, go to another room and um, trying to introduce sex and sex sex education. So this was how um, Johnson got sex education. So um, Thomas, um, like like showed George um his penis and talked and talked about and um told George to um uh, and they were they they um had the TV on and it was to um a volume where nobody can hear them. So um Thomas um had George to um suck his penis or or lick it or something. They said taste it. So it was it was so it was so graphic. So but um it was um like George didn't understand what was going on, and then Thomas told George, uh, and then George, and then Thomas um, sucked on George's penis, and then um, they, um, and then Tom, and then Thomas told George to get on the couch, and um, and then they were um, dry humping, like there was no penetration. But um, Thomas um, was dry humping, and um, jo- and then um, they got to the bathroom, and they were, and then Thomas was teaching George masturbation, and then um, Thomas ejaculated um, onto the toilet. So George was like, "I don't know what's going on," and so Thomas was. It, that, this is pretty much rape culture and pretty much talks about how someone is taking advantage of someone else. That's because rape is p- about power, not even just consent, but it's literally, it's literally about a power dynamic and someone is taking control of someone because George didn't understand. Like he, like George, you literally see it in the, in this chapter, George didn't understand what he, they were going, was going, was happening to them. And, um, and um and then Tom, yeah Thomas was pretty much taking advantage of George so it was a uh, it was a chapter that was very tough to go through and um and then um George talked and then Thomas eventually died be- because um Thomas was um fighting um to um protect um someone who was que- someone who was queer i think trying to protect a trans woman later in life and um, and then George um, talked about how they were going through rage because they realized that they've been harmed. And even when Thomas de- was dead, um, they were trying to struggle, trying to articulate the emotions because it was their cousin. It was their cousin, and so it, you were trying to understand what what inflict what motivated your cousin to do that to you. So um, George eventually got to a place where they got empathy for Thomas because they understand like how culture and how the culture of like down low and and closeted um, um, queer people go through, especially queer men, because um, patriarchy and all that stuff, like like something like sexuality, you hide that stuff, but um you you understand like like George was trying to understand how did Thomas learn all this stuff and they realized that Thomas was probably going through some sexual abuse and stuff like that like that cuz they understand cuz it's this cycle of violence and harm that um that that's like probably the only understanding you can make of it and that's what George um decided to take and they got to a pl- and got to a place of healing through therapy and stuff like that. So it was it was um it was a fascinating chapter. It went into like the what um Adrian Marie Brown was talking about and um pleasure activism and how we think about harm and what motivated people to do harm. And um talk also talk about how taboo of a subject sex is. Cause it's cause um sex um some for some people they only learn about abstinence and celibacy they only learn um heterosexual sex and stuff like that 
So also because it wasn't also George's introduction to sex education, it was an introduction to queer sex education. So that motivated George to suppress their queer identity even more. So and then when they got in more in touch with them, their identity, they got to a place where an understanding that will probably motivated Thomas to um do that to George. So it was a it was a fascinating chapter. Um but you can learn a lot about like harm because because I think it's important to know that someone who's being harmed, it's important to center themselves and make sh and trying to give them power and know that they have power and um, and they were stripped of that power because of the harm that was done to them. And it's important to in the healing process that they get the power back and that they're centered and their desires, needs and wants are centered and it's important to take attention to that. So, um, yeah. And Johnson um, talked about how Thomas died. Um, they said, um, the same masculinity and manhood ideology that forced you and me to hide our identities is the same masculinity and manhood ideology that got you killed. And life can be tragic. Life can be so tragic in that way. I'm now okay with ending this part of the past on this page. I can only hope the story frees someone else who may be holding guilt from an encounter with an abuser because Johnson understands like they're not the only ones that are that are having ha that had this experience like other people are going through these experiences of abuse and stuff like that and it's up to us to change to do something to um get this cult dismantle this culture and not continue this cycle of violence and um yeah that was the end of chapter 11 and then chapter 12 um is um the next it's titled the prom kings we never were so um this was in um i think high school and and um johnson was talking about when they were taking a school bus to high school how they always encountered this boy that they found attractive like they had a crush on this on this boy so it was their first time finding attraction to another man and to another boy teenager and um, trying to understand sexuality and identity. And um, and then um, they were talking about um, September 11th, 9-11 happened. So pretty much this, um, you only, you have to live life with no regrets um, mindset that um, um, Johnson was going through. So um, they took matters into their own hands and approached them. Um, the boy that they had a crush on, and their name was Zamis, Zamis or something like that. Sorry if I, if I mispronounced it. But um, Johnson was um, a junior, and um, Zamis was a freshman, so they were able to just stay in terms of friends and stuff like that. They didn't like know how to get into a place of relationship or romance and stuff like that, and. Um, Knowing back then, because this was like in the early 2000s, so we don't know, understanding queerness and sexuality, it was still like a taboo subject back then. And, um, yeah, so, um, Zamis and George eventually became friends, and, um, they were, they got to, um, they talked to each other every day, so it was also their first good friendship with a boy so um yeah they talked about how i was all i always had girlfriends and stuff like that because of my effeminate nature but um i was able to have a boy as a friend and um they they had a good relationship and um they had this um discussion and um i think zamis what yeah zamis was asking if george was gay and um, George was still struggling with their identity, so they said no, and they were still suppressing it. And um, George asked Zamis if he was gay, and then Zamis said, no, I'm not. But then years passed, and then Johnson eventually got to a place where they accepted, their, accepted and came out as gay. And um, they, got to, they went to um, a gay pride event, and then they saw Zamis. So Zamis identified, I think, either as queer or gay. So um, tells you 
And yeah, titled The Prom Kings We Never Were because who knows what would have happened if George expressed that, said, yes, I'm gay. And then Zamis said, yes, I'm also gay. That probably would have motiva- motivated Zamis to um come out because both of them eventually become became gay. And who knows what would have happened if they eventually got into a relationship. They probably could have been prom kings. So, um... And that that was a and, and that was a fascinating chapter, and um, Johnson said the same access we should have to express and showcase our love, better yet, express and showcase ourselves. So talking about sh- expressing that love and um, through each other and how that is connected with the love that we have for ourselves, and um, yeah, they said they said we. And they said, love who you want to love and do it unapologetically, including that face you see every day in the mirror. I deserve that kind of love. They deserve that kind of love. We deserve that kind of love. We should have been prom kings. And um, yeah, so that was pretty much the gist of that chapter, how you should love out loud, love who you love, who you love out loud. Especially, especially when it's just safe to do so. When y'all in the safe an environment where y'all can do that, y'all have the the safety net to and the support system with you and the resources. You should be able to love out loud. And um, to this day, they're just still good friends, but they they still have a good friendship with each other. And um, chapter thirteen, this will be the last chapter for this video. And it's titled Setting Myself Free or Setting Myself Up. So this is the um, the end of high school. So um, Johnson was um, a senior then. And pretty much talk about high school graduation and um, looking into colleges and what motivated them to go to Virginia Union University. And they went to Virginia Uni- Union University because they want to get away. They want to get out of state. And they had this idea that since I'm suppressing my identity here, I can probably be gay in Virginia and be proud of my queer identity since I'm not in an environment where I don't feel comfortable. So trying to... And because you, when because um when you um go to college, you learn more about yourself and your wants and desires and needs and stuff like that. You learn more about yourself and what be in tune with um your identity and stuff like that. And college helps you do that. So um, lucky and they were lucky enough to have a cousin that um went to Virginia Union the year before, so they were able to get an off campus apartment. Because they were trying to think about finances and stuff like that. And um, Johnson got like a presidential scholarship from Virginia Union University. So expenses were covered for, like from especially from family and through the scholarship and stuff like that. So they were able to um, get secure Johnson in a Virginia Union University. And um, what else was going on? Yeah, pretty much talking about growing up and stuff like that, how hard it was to um, go in an environment that's miles away from your family, especially your um, nanny, mom and dad, who um, could, who um, you, you were that shy kid, that shy little five-year-old, and now here you are doing all of this stuff, being outspoken and... Um, and um, be willing to take chances, do all these sports and activities, and um, got accepted to college and stuff like that. So it tells you how far you came, even though you're still learning about yourself. You came, you got, you came so far. And um, what else happened? And um, and then when they and when they got to um, Virginia Union and. Uh, and when they got to Virginia Union, they were still um, suppressing their queer identity. They were still um, trying to understand themselves. And um, when they were making friends and stuff like that, because we're tr- they're still trying, because I don't think queerness was accepted back then. I think this was in 2003. Yeah. But yeah. And um, 
also t- also and Johnson also had a Beyonce moment because Dangerously in Love was released then and talked about how Beyonce helped um, Johnson be in tune with their femininity and give them like a source of freedom with um, their expression and performance and felt more in tune with themselves and the same thing that happened when you got from Matthew Johnson to George Matthew Johnson and stuff like that and um, being and be have an affinity with your identity and um yeah and that was it and then they had this and then um the ending where they all always give solutions at the end of the chapter um what they were talking about and um when they were still suppressing their queer identity it was somewhat devastating that I had planned for so long to have my moment. It was still not ready for it. Like you have to understand to be, yeah, you have to be comfortable with your um, queerness first before you actually be comfortable enough to to share that with um, the world and um, and with other people, even with even if it's with your friends and family and stuff like that. Because Johnson didn't really really come out until they were um, 25. So in college, they were still trying to learn about themselves. And Johnson said, some of us are pressured into acceptance of an identity before we are fully ready to accept it ourselves. And that's true because of masculinity and gender and our understandings of race, gender, and um, sexuality. We're um, There's all these policing of what's considered Black, what's considered man, what's considered... Um, masculine and stuff like that was considered straight and you know yeah all these um stereotypes that you have to combat and these um perceptions that you have to face even when you come out and and um knowing that it's important to know um that eventually you should come out because um you'll you'll experience joy and community like you never felt more you'll never love yourself you'll never love you'll never love yourself like you love yourself um beforehand and um yeah so um and it's important to be unapologetic about it and live life with no regrets and um yeah so that was um the end of um chapter 13 and i like how um johnson was talking about um, this redefinition of coming out, they they say at they don't they don't um call it coming out. They call it inviting someone in. You inviting person to learn more about yourself. You're not coming out of um of um hiding. Like some people knew that they were um gay, that they were queer, and not sh- and going through things, and they probably didn't have the understanding, the language, and um the mindset and the the understanding to um be affirmed in their queer identity and um yeah so that was and um yeah you're just you're inviting someone to learn more about yourself not even just by yourself but um the environment what made you the person you are today and um the culture that um you have an affinity you I have an identity with so that was it and um that was um the end of act three so that was act two and act three so that was it for this video so act four is the last chapter and of the um, the book so i'm going to make another video um for that and um thank y'all for um watching this part and um stay tuned make sure you follow um at raisin souls on instagram and at intellectual albert my personal instagram Everything will be on the description box below. So um, stay tuned and thank you.